to go to our round table to discuss the experiences of different states in the evaluation refitting operation and maintenance of school infrastructure in Mexico. We have two speakers uh, with us, engineer Eduardo Gonz Gutierrez and Renato Verron. But also we welcome our other four speakers, the director general of the Colimense Institute of Education, Physical and Infrastructure. And we also have the presence of a Professor Rafael Navas Camacho from the State of Mexico Institute of Education, Physical Infrastructure. Thank you for being with us. We also have Engineer Jorge Alcocer Navarrete, Director General of the Guerrero Institute of Education, Physical Infrastructure. Welcome. And lastly, we have the participation of Adolfo Maldonado Fuentes, Director General of the Oaxaca Institute, Builder of Physical Education Infrastructure. The format of this roundtable will focus in three big topics. Each panel member will have a two four-minute participations, and we will also have a round to share your conclusions. The topic that we have set after the presentation from Dr. Ildefonso and how the response was in terms of national wide attention is the experience in damage surveying and reconstruction of school infrastructure. And what are the big lessons, obstacles and advantages observed in the different processes that were it carried out, how did that take place, all the surveying, and how you have managed the rebuilding process. So I would like to give the floor, first of all, to Professor Rafael Navas, so he can share his experience from the state of Mexico. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Good day. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for inviting the state of Mexico Institute of School Infrastructure. And as you mentioned in 2017, we focused on 12 municipalities where we were able to identify 1,009 projects that we had to address, but there were other 103 other municipalities. We had questions from parents and principals to address these buildings. They asked to schedule visits and we realized that most of the damages were due, unfortunately, to self-construction and lack of maintenance and some other radical cases because of the age of the schools. We detected 1,009 damaged buildings, and in the other 130 municipalities, we found 3,900 damaged buildings. We categorized the damages into three minor, partial, and total damage. And I must say that INIFED's capabilities were surpassed. The number of buildings damaged was greater, and our capability was surpassed. We had many obstacles in the diagnostic process, 
ser el total de la suma de, de los 1.009 más los 3.900 son eh, 4.900. El total es, por supuesto, 4.909 buildings. Pero este número creció porque en un building there are several in one school there are several buildings in one school we can have a kindergarten an elementary school or grade school and a middle school and so these four something buildings became over six thousand of course they were closed and we also received wrong data the, about the address of the schools. These damages instilled restlessness in the population and panic, lack of technical knowledge in the community, civil society, parents, and schools caused the demolition of several of these schools by themselves because of the magnitude of the earthquake. We also found different criteria to assess the damage. The Mexican Association of the Construction Industry also helped us as well as the municipalities in the region and experts from INIFED and the capabilities were surpassed even after that. Because we weren't prepared for this contingency, we had to immediately improve our system to survey damages and after this, we determined the classification, as you can see here, whether if it's a reconstruction, whether it's lesser damage. And we had these different types of evaluations, minor evaluation, partial and total evaluations. And again, after this traffic light system, we, with the personnel from insurance companies, determined the cost of the damage in the 12 municipalities of this effort. We also saw standardized methods to analyze the damage, communication with schools and databases of electronic data. The risk map was done by civil protection. According to the epicenter of the earthquake, the earthquake that shook the state of Mexico was never before seen which will increase the Mercalli scale. And we had to cordon off the buildings that suffered damages in order to protect the rest of the school buildings. Here you can see some of the damaged buildings in Tenancingo, close to Oquilan which was the municipality that was impacted the most after the earthquake. You see the damages because of the earthquake, the complete demolitions, and in the last images, we see the final building. What this earthquake taught us was that we need to have a standard and rules and regulation. And because the state of Mexico has a very specific orography and topography. We need to professionalize the building of these schools. And unfortunately, we saw many demolitions of 
buildings with reported damages. And in our visit, we provided technical talks and lectures. We gave brochures. We tried to raise awareness with the population. 90% of the damages in the schools was due, unfortunately, because of self-construction that did not follow any norms or standards, many of them by parents and many others, because the municipality, many of the municipalities didn't touch base with us here. This is another construction in Tultitlan, in the Valley of Mexico, where you can see that the damages were close to the ones observed in Oquilan, virtually total damage to these buildings. I know that I don't have a lot of time, and that's why I... I will simply like to state some challenges and goals for 2021 for our institute. What are we doing at INIFET? This year, we have planned the conclusion of these constructions by December 2021. Uh, yet we need uh, almost 590 million pesos. We are developing a CGOBE system to have quick and less bureaucratic communication between the government and INIFET. And in coordination, we're working with strategies and processes in order to have the supervision of efficient and quality construction. We are strengthening the State of Mexico Institute for Educational Physical Infrastructure in order to have people with higher profiles, we're training them year after year, and if we comply with all these previous goals, we will capture more resources, improving educational infrastructure in the state of Mexico, and thus be ready for the new contingencies in the future. Thank you, Professor Navas. Professor Navas had requested to combine all his interventions into one. And now I would like to give the floor to Adolfo Mandonado for him to tell us what challenges they found in Oaxaca State when carrying out the damage survey efforts. Mr. Maldonado, can you please share the challenges and opportunities that you found out in Oaxaca? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us to this workshop, which has been very enriching, especially for future. Your microphone is off. Can you hear me now? Yes. I was telling you that I am very grateful to having been invited to this workshop. It will be very enriching for Oaxaca State and for the whole country, because I am certain that after the 2017 earthquake, we have set a precedent about how to behave after these seismic events, which are very challenging. As we know, the state of Oaxaca is uh, one of the states with a lot of municipalities and surrounding terrain that is very diverse. That's why damage surveying, especially after September 7th, 2017, Based on the guidelines that Fonden issues, uh, we are talking about a short period of time, and at times we can't carry out an effective survey. Geographic uh, inspection was complicated in this state. The declaration of natural disaster emergency happened in 200 and something municipalities. So we're talking about 
very short timetables with a lot of social issues. And as my colleague from the state of Mexico mentioned, we had to do a quick strategy to be able to do the survey in those 20 days after the declaration. 3,001 schools reported damages and 1,200 of those had severe damages and 1,800 had minor damages, fortunately. Let me reiterate, the survey effort is quite difficult in the June 25th earthquake. To do the survey of a school, sometimes you need to spend four hours to get to the school, but two of those hours you need to walk. Two hours walking back, so it's eight hours to walk to a school. That is why we have always said that while we all are aware of the situation of the Fonden, there needs to be more flexibility in the guidelines to do these surveys in order for us to do an effective survey effort and to do surveys of the reality that is happening in our education infrastructure because of earthquake damage or any other natural disaster. It's also paradoxical to know that Fonden asks us to do the survey, but when we have to upload the data to the database and all the procedures that Fonden requests, we haven't had any response neither positive nor negative after Jan June 24th. And I think that this is happening in all states. Parents who are concerned because schools are the only place where they leave their children, they have to be safe. They don't ask us for beautiful schools, but for safe schools, I'm sorry, you have run out of time for your first intervention, but we're going to go back to this topic of parents. I will now like to give the floor to Engineer Alcocer to ask him what is the perspective of Guerrero State about having proper procedures to do early surveys of damages after earthquakes. Hello, I salute everyone. In Guerrero State, because of the earthquakes that took place in September 7th, 1917, as well as the tropical storms that have hit our coasts, we have had learning experiences in our institute and also in our schools, which have allowed us to identify the strengths to treat immediate partial supports and interventions. And we've also identified the areas of opportunities. And with this, we can generate strategies that can afford immediate and effective aid with the available resources. In Guerrero State, with the earthquakes from 2017, many schools were impacted and many of them all and from these buildings, all of them were atypical constructions. Now, during the identification process, we saw strengths that we need to keep. For example, the interinstitutional relationship between INGIFES and IMIFED, the solidarity between the school communities the school, the engineer and architect associations were fundamental in the aid and for the financial backing, the design of the infrastructure, we owe it to INIFED and without a doubt, we will include new methodologies to our survey methodologies. 
working with local companies with local material has instilled uh, trust because they know the quality of materials communication has been really important and is a very important strength in our communities and in local authorities because it allows us to answer for these issues in situ calendars and rules and regulations allow us to be accountable to society these actions generate transparency and transparency gives certainty to our community and schools and without a doubt that is a very important strength and i can list many other strengths but I would like to tell you what some of the areas of opportunities are. In Guerrero State, we don't have a risk atlas, for example. This does not allow us to build risk maps where we can specifically locate schools that are vulnerable because of natural disasters. In most schools, we don't have civil protection plans and the ones that do have them, they see it as a requirement and not as a tool that can be used before and after a natural disaster. Sometimes they are incomplete. We need to have systems that we can find a legal certainty document for the school, all the way to a plan with geo-references and other data that allow us to build efficient strategies social conflict without a doubt is an area of opportunity because it translates into demonstrations and protests these can cause sometimes these problems after earthquakes we have run out of time we're going to go back to you for your next intervention now that you have set up a general overview of the complications let's talk about the proposals that we can set to improve response processes both immediately to survey the damages and to reconstruct and rebuild i would now like to give the floor to Dr. Ilefonso Gonzalez, what can we do to cover these areas of opportunities? Thank you once more. I salute the heads of the state institutes that are in this round table. Now, after the earthquakes of 2017 and 2018, we were able to see, as mentioned by my colleague, my colleagues, the efforts were well-intentioned, but technical rigor was lacking in order to plan better. As a consequence, out of a census of almost 3,000 schools with damages, not all of them had damages because of the earthquake. However, there were others had to be added to these census. So, in order to address the damage because of the earthquake was very difficult because we weren't even precise about what we had to address. We set out the task to get the local institutes involved in 2019, something that took us all of the year. And that's why I mentioned that more than 370 schools continue to have damages because of the earthquake. Fortunately, this does not mean that, well, of course, the, because of the pandemic, the students are outside of the classrooms, but that doesn't mean that something was being done in the previous years, in 2019 and 2020. What happened was that many of the students 
were relocated to other classrooms, to other school centers. We always looked to not affect the classes and the teachings. However, in the short run, we're going to go back to schools and we need to enable these spaces for the better learning of our children. This, of course, implies money, which is always lacking. And so we're going to be looking for the support of foundations and request the help of institute directors for this financing so we can all finish with these tasks by mid-year. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I now would like to talk to Engineer Gutierrez from the Colima Institute. What ideas do you have to improve the response processes in general? Can you please share those ideas with us? Thank you so much for inviting us. We've learned so much from this meeting, from this workshop. I want to share with you very quickly risks in Colima, risks from volcanoes, earthquakes, cyclones, and floods hydro meteorological category disasters. We have all of them. Here you see what happens in Colima, our home state, and progress we've made on resilience and also education programs for the population. We have the risk atlas. This is the atlas we have in Colima. This is a wonderful tool we've used for our decisions. We are in zone D. This is seismic zone D. In red, we have the, we have the high part, yellow, and the green are the low parts, eight, degrees. This is the type of earthquakes we have. And this is a tool for our decisions. On the right hand side, we have the cyclone and hurricanes. In our geography, you have here the coast area with the highest number of phenomena. And in other colors, you have lower risk level, low and medium levels, where we can also have this possibility of preparedness. In Colima, because of this catastrophic events, seismic or weather events, we have immediate attention methodologies from the moment the phenomenon occurs. We have a diagnosis which has been updated 100% in terms of the schools in the state. We know the vulnerability and we know the geographical vulnerable areas. We have 10 municipalities in Colima, of course, our staff is prepared. We have a technician, a supervisor per municipality. They have all the required information for their decisions in this time of disaster. After the event, immediately after, out in the field, through the technician and supervisor, through the Civil Protection Institute, we set priorities in the zones with the highest ring, risk. We have a civil protection unit here. That means this is an orderly process. 
and we have to coordinate that work, which is what we do through this civil protection unit. We start coordinating our work with INIFED, with the education sectors and parents as well. Thank you so much. Sorry, this is just the first segment for your participation. We are going back to you in just a few minutes. Thank you, engineer. Now, Dr. Renato Berron, could you share the vision? How can we improve processes and the chaos we had in 2017 and the construction process to four minutes, please, Dr. Berron. Thank you so much. We have a document discussing improvement of the process with four stages. This is the quick assessment evaluation, including the inspection. This is very important. We had so many problems. Fortunately, the inspection process had already been designed because before the 2017 earthquake, we had simulations, we had drills. So we were familiar with this document. However, many mistakes were made. Duplicity and uh, we wasted energy and time because of those mistakes. And the brigades did not have enough experts. They were mainly made up of young people. We need specialists. So we recognized all those mistakes. And I know I don't have much time to go into greater detail on this. The second stage, no, rather the first stage did get all the community support. We had technical support, engineers, everyone participated. I was very happy with everyone and everything. The second stage, as Sergio Alcocer was saying, it is a level two with a deeper analysis and report after the seismic event. However, the civil society representative didn't help us. Our institute had to work on many reports. Most of the experts' reports were done at this institute. We did get some support, but not much. But in terms of associations supporting us for the second stage, this didn't happen. The third stage of the retrofitting projects, there's so many things we can do to improve this third stage because the government created a reconstruction commission in charge of doing all this. The Institute supported the reconstruction commission because it looks into structural retrofitting or re reconstruction projects. They are analyzed in technical panels we created for this with people supporting us. Engineer Oñate is here with us. He is part of those working panels where we look at all the rehab or retrofitting projects at the technical level. This is what we did towards finding a solution. I believe they should all be part of a protocol, not only the first stage, many people just stay in the first stage, but then the second one comes with the experts reports and then the third one for the retrofitting and then the fourth stage has to do with implementing the retrofitting projects. And uh, here the issue is money. As I said at the beginning, money is a fundamental element. There's a word I really like it is uh, the the revulsive. We always need money. Thank you, doctor, for your participation. 
Mr. Maldonado, you're talking about those issues related to communicating with parents and the community. How can we improve the response time in terms of communication with communities to revisit the idea you were mentioning at the beginning? Thank you. It's very important to communicate with the parents, the municipal authorities, and teachers because they are directly responsible for the physical infrastructure of each one of the schools. How can we improve that? Yes, the timeline is very important, especially when we're doing the survey. We don't have enough time for the survey. We should be more flexible because we have very complex conditions. We should have direct communication as Dr. Renato Veron was mentioning, a specialist can do the actual survey, taking the necessary time to have the report on the damage of the physical st structure because of the natural disaster. When we do the survey, we do it very fast. Then, as it happened in 2017, what happens with the financing part? When we go back to the school, there are other demands from the community because so much time went by before we started implementing the retrofitting process. The social part is very important. This is where some of the processes are detained. This is important, but it's not just a matter of uh, talking to people. We have to give people answers. We have different areas of opportunity after the 2017, 2018, and 2020 earthquakes. I want to thank Inifed for helping us so much, for giving us all their support in the reconstruction process. We not only used from them resources, but we have used other resources and we have a very broad recognition to INIFED and also the Mexican Engineers Association. We're just beginning the risk atlas to know exactly what the schools are like right now in terms of their structure. And also with the Engineers Association, we are building the first resilient school in the country. This is going to spearhead new constructions. It's a model we are working with, with Dr. Ildefonso, he knows it very well. This is a good area of opportunity. We have to look ahead and see how we can continue working together. On our part, let me just say that Oaxaca, as all the states, has its complexities. We insist on the timing for the surveys and the way to do this professionally according to requirements. Thank you for this perspective from Oaxaca. Now, Let's move forward. We have already seen problems when we have damages in terms of uh, resource distribution. So from here on, what can we do to increase general resilience of school communities in the different school buildings with less damage, different regulations, maybe improved designs, Engineer Alcocer, what would you say on this? What ideas do you have for us to improve resilience in our school communities and buildings from now on? Your microphone, please. Yes, we have the experience we've made progress in terms of resilience in schools. 
but we're just beginning. We could talk about methodology from its origin and about addressing problems so that we can start and stop rather, so that we can stop improvising and start doing things in a better coordinated manner. We would define this as the beginning of a new development, a new opportunity. After a natural disaster, anything damaging school structure, we could overcome those problems. It sounds simple, but it is more complex than all that. The most complex thing is to identify or discover conditions that would allow us to move in this direction. Those conditions could be identified as follows. One, security, safety. We can give school communities and society at large under technical operational conditions for us to guarantee protocols and procedures aimed at accomplishing goals of the reestablishment of physical conditions of places with problems. And then going back to normality is very important. For that, we should have time resource, physical conditions, social participation, diagnosis, risk maps, and strategies. That's the type of scenario we have to have. Now, culture, this is the set of spiritual material goods, beliefs, and traditions and customs. In Mexico, we recognize collaborative behavior takes place in natural disasters and emergencies. We have to change this to be more efficient and better in the work we do. Now, relations become success. Having a relationship is having resilience. Relations means a major team to face a problem. NFED has been leading efforts in different states and municipalities. The states should be working more and more with civil protection authority and other people that could participate to guarantee recovery, ensure purposes, have resilience. And with that, doctor resilience as a central concept can be accomplished if the other goals are also accomplished. Yes, thank you so much. It's very important for us to understand this concept of resilience in a very comprehensive fashion. Let's go back to Engineer Gutierrez. Could you share with us how the regional prototypes and standards can improve the conditions of school buildings? to improve general conditions of resilience in communities. Please, engineer, thank you. Yes, I will share with you to show you what it is that we're doing in Colima. Listening to Dr. Alcocer, who rightly said, that's what we should do. And this is what I'm trying to explain. The first one is a video you see, finally, in this type of construction, we're not consulted. This, this is an explosion over a weekend. Uh, those are kitchens where they do not consult our institute. And finally, that's what happens. They put the gas tanks inside the kitchen and it explodes as you saw it there. Yes, in terms of the standards, I think we should be allowed to tell people exactly what happens when standards are not followed. And this is the effect, incredible, terrible impact. And the standards were not followed, as you can see. But look at the image here, truly incredible. That's what happened in this explosion over the weekend. Another video very fast related to a cyclone in Colima. There's 
a structure that was not consulted for it to be built. We'll show you what happened. And it was not able to take all the wind because of the cyclone at the end. One of the tents tore, one of the canvases tore, and you see that we've been working with parents and the education sector, demanding them to comply with the standards. What we should continue doing, I think, is working on the cultural part so that all education spaces honor the standards. That's why we're always concerned about this. And that's what I was telling Dr. Defonso about the nationwide programs. The standards are very important. And the institutes should convey those standards to people. We've made progress but sometimes policies change and we are moving forward nationwide in terms of disclosing and letting people know about the standards, especially in education standards and education buildings. But this is something we should continue doing. One minute, yes, 40 seconds. 40 seconds, let's see if I can find this. Is very interesting to see the effect of the cyclone. Let me show it to you. We're not seeing it, engineer. We can't see it. Here we go. You can see. Sí, sí lo pudimos ver, ingeniero, eh, muy impresionantes ambos videos y pues sí, la vulnerabilidad que es se... very well, thank you so much. We can see what can be generated when people do not obey standards. Now, in terms of those standards, Dr. Berron, you're in charge of Mexico City construction quality. Throughout the day, we mentioned supervision. The project may be very good, but if it's not well, supervised, many problems can arise. How can we enhance supervision of the construction works and the impact this is going to have on improving our schools? First of all, let me say that in terms of uh, construction regulations in Mexico City, if you read it, you never find the word works supervision. What you find is a control system that is comprised of the works uh, directors and people that are co-responsible, facilities, infrastructure, or structural safety. That's the control mechanism. We have set out to study this in a very deep and detailed manner. It has many deficiencies, for instance, there's a unfair competition among co-responsible elements, and this is a devaluation of the cost of the service of those administrative coordinators. There's conflict of interest as well. For instance, I'm co-responsible for a project and I have to sanction or penalize some other project, but then he is paying me. He's paying for my fees. So there's a conflict of interest. On the other hand, we have also seen that our control mechanism has, or rather it is granted with no control whatsoever. 
And of course, there's no human capacity that can look into so many documents. And of course, this has a terrible impact on building safety. These are the typical problems. I've mentioned three of them, but we have others of lesser importance that have generated various problems. For instance, construction regulation and control mechanisms. I think it is well designed. If we compare that to others, in Mexico City, the construction regulation is really at the forefront of other legislations, the environmental one, the one on water resources. No comparison is possible here. We are right at the forefront, especially in terms of technological scientific development and a control mechanism. Other legislation don't even, other legislations don't even have that. So we've generated reforms for the regulation and other actions aimed at improving and enhancing it. It's not there yet. It's very difficult to find the ideal state in terms of control mechanisms, but it has been significantly improved vis-a-vis -vis what it used to be in the past. I'm convinced that after the 27 earthquake, the constructions regulation is very good. That is from the technical viewpoint, but also the control mechanism. There are many buildings, some buildings among those that fell. It wasn't because of resistance or strength problems or quality in terms of the construction. It's they, they didn't put the right uh, beams according to the regulation or the concrete quality was not according to specification. These are control mechanisms. It's not that this is an obsolete regulation or that it is not complete. It has to do with material quality rather. This is the control mechanism that I am now mentioning. We have to enhance it and this is exactly what we're doing. Thank you so much for your comments. Let me close this round to go on to conclusions. Dr. Gonzalez, there are international studies saying or talking about the advantage of preventive reinforcement for dollar we invest in prevention, we say seven dollars in reconstruction in case of an event which is the perspective of the institute it's been said today dr barron said it it is a resource problem resources are limited have you thought of a strategy to in gradually increase school safety and make resource use more efficient have you discussed any of those things, doctor? Well, in terms of the control process, Dr. Renato Barron says that we have to improve control mechanisms. I fully agree with that. Whenever we suffer consequences of an earthquake, a strong earthquake, we then look into complementary standards within the regulation. And this is something we do. It is quite well addressed, as Dr. Barron said, but implementing control mechanisms through efficient supervision, this is the challenge we still face in INIFED and some of the local institutes. And I see, I say this with all due respect, for everyone, we have to have the participation of businesses and companies linked to the construction of physical infrastructure. So there's a lot of improvisation taking place. This is something that exists. We all know it and suffer it. So supervision of construction works, comply with standards and regulations, all those things are very important. In terms of in situ manufacturing of concrete, all rules should be followed in terms of the columns and other structural elements. 
this is very important. It was mentioned this mo morning, rather, by Dr. Alcocer. It's very important for us to have efficient control mechanisms, for us to have high responsibility of construction companies and appropriate supervision and oversight for us to build with increasingly better quality. And this is something we're going to be doing to considerably improve conditions so that we will not be suffering unfortunate or lamentable consequences. This is very important. It has to do with the existing rules that have been duly accepted by the different commissions. We're talking about clear safety, security regulations in terms of seismic motions or movements. We have to make sure infrastructure that has been there for many years that has not been retrofitted. This is a major challenge. A lot of control and observation are necessary to look into any type of risk condition in those buildings. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. You have shared many interesting points of view. And to finish this round table, I would like to have one last round for each one of our speakers to share a final message. I would like to start with Mr. Maldonado. Do you have a final thought about two minutes? about everything that we have mentioned. Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you again for inviting me to this workshop. Dr. Sergio Alcocer, Dr. Quiroga, everyone. And to conclude, yes, we need resources. But again, we need to understand the different terrain that can make the surveying activities more complicated. In Oaxaca State, after the earthquakes of 2017 and 2018, had access to 500 million pesos, but we weren't able to execute the projects. We had the money, but not the time or the terrain. It was impossible for us. So taking advantage of areas of opportunities has helped us. We're gonna work on resilience. We have the first school at the national level that will allow us to build these type of constructions, especially with the building of schools after the 2020 earthquake. So working as a team is also very important, working together with architects associations and engineers or associations that allow us to have clarity and certainty about what is going on and what we're headed to with constant dialogue with authorities, professors and parents to ensure safe conditions that allow students and teachers to be in dignified buildings. Professor Navas, we have time for just a quick two-minute intervention. Thank you very much, Luciano. It is a big challenge. We must focus especially on improving the supervision of these constructions. It's true, we have moved forward a lot in seismic events that INIFED has shared, but the big challenge of all the institutes is supervision. Visiting the schools before kickstarting the project because needs change. We might have a request from two years ago and when we attend the building, it might be possible that the community or the local government has 
already moved forward with some repairs. So we need to involve students, parents, and of course, supervised constantly from start to finish. And this is important, of course, to do the payment of these projects that might be a hindrance with financial institutions. Uh, what about you, Engineer Eduardo Gutierrez? Thank you again for inviting me. I would like to share the, that in the case of Colima, we have issued a proposal to create the IFE or Educational Physical Infrastructure that will cover everything related to educational infrastructure. Let me show you this manual we're working on together with the personnel from the Secretariat of Education and the people in charge of providing maintenance to this institute. Once again, thank you very much for your attention and hopefully more and more workshops will be able to take place. We were given very little time and we wanted to share many, many things. Thank you, engineer. Obviously, the topic is very big and we will have to think of future events. Is there any final comment that you would like to share? In order to improve these goals, we need to link research and take advantage of all the experience from local institutions and associations that have participated in the reconstruction efforts of these buildings that would create a lot of improvements. The documentation of all these data will allow us to have cer more certain diagnostics, reports, and may this workshop be a starting point to more resilience and sustainability and constant improvement of these buildings. I would like to acknowledge that the four documents that are going to be presented tomorrow by Dr. Alcocer and scholarship holders will be, without a doubt, very important documents to consult in institutions. And without a doubt, there will be proposals to carry out work tables so we can learn and in implement these documents in future efforts. Thank you very much, Dr. Engineer Alcocer. Dr. Barron, are there any final comments from the Mexico City point of view? Yes, of course. Just as a final message, I think that the earthquake from 2017 in Mexico City impacted us a lot, specifically talking about a private school in the south of the city. And this hit, this impact has made the authorities that are currently in power in Mexico City to be very sensitive about this matter. And there's a lot of focus precisely to provide this resilience to these school centers. I think that those of us in the government must seize this focus. We not always have governments with this type of sensitivity. I think that we need to carry out many activities like this forum, like the projects that we have in the government to improve resilience in the educational infrastructure in order to achieve less damages in a future earthquake. 
greater than the one in 85 or 2017, that would be a success. And let's hope that is the case. That's what we all expect. Dr. Barron and everyone involved is precisely that is what they wish. Are there any final messages to wrap up the session? Yes, of course. Luciano, I would like to thank the Engineering Institute, my colleagues in INIFED, Dr. Renato Barron and all of the other authorities in this panel. In the conclusions, it is clear that if complementary regulations help us in what refers to sustainability, because we have very old school centers with 50 or more years of service, we also need to think about ideas of retrofitting. We must not forget about the imagination necessary and the commitment to work together, states, the federation and municipalities. It, this is for the common good and simply we need to invest in our greatest wealth, which is children, the future of Mexico. It is the obligation of the Mexican government and Mexican state to focus on them because they are the nation of the present and the future. When we're all gone, they will remain. And so we need to make sure that the spaces for them to learn have the highest possible safety conditions. So I invite everyone to combine our imagination and to organize in such a way to generate the conditions in order to have safer buildings and schools. There's nothing more noble, in my opinion, than investing in schools. The little ones that are the future of our nation go there. So I really enjoyed this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, doctor. And we can only thank all the panel members and speakers who have participated in this day. There are many questions, many comments. We're all going to share them with you so you can answer the questions from our audience. I can only thank the organizing committee of this workshop for allowing me to be today's moderator. And we remind you that we expect you tomorrow at 9 a.m. so we can have the last session of this workshop. Thank you so much for being with us. See you tomorrow. Good afternoon.